Hello, welcome to Web of Stories. My name is Melinda and I am here with a not super speedy, therefore not five on Friday, uh, group of recommendations for you. November is um, Indigenous Peoples Month, um, I think technically. So I want to talk a little bit about language here. Um, I want to be really um, respectful of how I uh, refer to people and I have done some research on this um, about how Indigenous people mainly in the United States and Canada, uh, prefer to be referred to. Um, obviously, the term Indian is a no-go, um, but they also don't like the term Native American, or at least the ones I have watched. This is not, you know, I've looked at some creators, so this is just the input I've gotten. Native American is actually a term that they would prefer not to use. Um, their preferred terms are, if you know their, their tribal affiliation, to use that. So, Diné... Uh, Chippewa, whatever, whatever, if you know it. Um, obviously, you, there's many cases when you might not know it. Um, or the term native, not Native American, native, because they predate America. So I'm going to use the term or indig indigenous works as well, indigenous people works. Um, and I know in Canada, they use the term First Nations, which I think is lovely, but that's not actually a term used in the United States to refer to the native people here. Um, although I think it's a very lovely term. <laughs> not that I have any say in it, but just a little observation. So I'm going to be using the term native and indigenous when I don't know, when I'm talking as a group or when I don't know a tribal name. Um, <clears throat> but it is Indigenous Peoples Month. And I have seen a lot of videos of people giving uh, reader recommendations for works by indigenous writers, and they have all been wonderful. I recommend you go check them all out because there are some great books there. I read a lot of indigenous literature. Um, I've always been really interested in it, and I don't really not really sure why um I think part of it is um I'm speaking as an American here as a, a citizen of the United States the United States does not have a good track record with um non non-European <laughs> descended peoples let's just put it that way um and there is a lot out there. I don't, and I'm not going to like rank who's been treated the worst. That's not the point of this. But what I'm saying is you, you hear a lot of how the African-American experience has been. You hear about how, for example, the Asian experience, especially in terms of World War II, has been. And you hear a lot of this. But when it comes to indigenous peoples, it's different. They seem to be treated, oh, they're just a conquered people. And there has been such... A history of assimilation with them which isn't really present in the other ones in the other you know with like African Americans or Asian Americans or uh, people of Latin American descent um, maybe with that because that also falls into indigenous but the goal there has been unfortunately by the the society of the United States has been to try to basically wipe them out um, and I think that's horrible and I think because of that, I've always been really drawn to reading indigenous literature and learning more about their experience. So um, I highly recommend going and checking out everybody's video who has recommendations because there are some great recommendations there. I have seven books here. Um, actually, I have six books here and then one that I don't physically own a copy of that I haven't seen on other lists or haven't seen on many other lists that I would really recommend um, just if you're looking for something a little different. And then at the end, um, I have a tip about a resource that uh, you might want to check out. But let's, I'm sorry, all of my devices are making noise at once. Sorry about that. Anyway, so let me start with the books. This first book is the only one I have not completed. I am currently reading it and I have spoken about it in other videos. And that's Never Whistle at Night, an indigenous dark fiction anthology. This is edited by Shane Hawk and Theodore C. Van Alst. There are a lot of stories in here. Um, they are dark horror ones. Um, that's probably where, what genre you would put them in. The authors included it. So the, the foreword is by Stephen Graham Jones, which is a very well-known name. Um, but there are also very awful, awful <laughs> sorry, also very well-known um, indigenous authors included in this, such as uh, Sherry Dimaline, Brandon Hodson, Hobson, excuse me, um, Tommy Orange, uh, Wabashug Rice, but then, then there's also authors who've never been published before. The first book, the first, I'm sorry, the first story in this collection is called um, Kashtuka. It's by, um, I should give you the author's name. <laughs> it's by an author who's never been published before. It's by Matilda Zeller. 
Um, and it is fantastic. It like that story got me completely hooked on this. So I am still working on it, but do recommend this. Um, this is a great way to also get a taste of a lot of different authors because there are a lot of indigenous authors there. A lot of them are included in this. Um, some of them are going to appear again <laughs> in this video, but you can get a taste of what their writing is like and see if there's some that really work for you. The next book I have, we're going to go for a big heavy hitter right now. Um, and it's by Louise, that's Louise Erdrich, who's probably one of the most well-known and celebrated indigenous authors. She's a member of the Turtle Mountain Chippewa tribe. Um, she owns the Birch Bark Bookstore in uh, Minneapolis or St. Paul in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. <laughs> and she has wrote many, many books. And I love her books. Um, I'll, the Plague of Doves is one of her books that a lot of people have been recommending this year. It's still on my TBR bookshelf. I'm sure it's wonderful. Just haven't gotten to it yet. Uh, and I was like, I knew I had to include a Louise Erdrich here. Um, and I have read several of hers. Um, some of her books hit people in different, you know, better than others. But the one I want to bring up here is The Night Watchman. This one, she won the Pulitzer Prize for. And uh, this is about the Chippewa, the turtle, her her tribal affiliation, the Turtle Mountain Chippewa tribe. And um, they are being, there's a move in Congress to emancipate them, which basically means it sounds, I know emancipation sounds like a great word and in some contexts it is, but it isn't here. It basically means they're getting rid of their tribal affiliation. They're just not recognizing their tribe anymore, which means that they lose the few benefits that they had. Um, and they don't have that many to begin with. So this, um, this book has, you know, there's a lot of characters in this book. I really felt like I didn't have a problem keeping the characters straight. I love the community that Erdrich creates in this. There's a lot of humor in it, but there's also, you know, she she really does address the serious issues very well. It is historical. It's said in 1953. That is when uh, the Turtle Mountain... Um, Chippewas were up for emancipation. So, and this is based, I believe, on her grandfather. I really enjoyed this book. This was a five-star book for me. Um, highly recommend it. I don't think you can really go wrong with Louise Erdrich, though. Um, she has so many books out there. You know, go look up, look her up and look at her, the descriptions of her books. And maybe if this one doesn't sound interesting to you, there probably is another one that does. But she's definitely an author I recommend all the time. The next book is the one I don't have a physical copy of. I have an electronic copy of, and I can't really put that up really nice. And that is Murder on the Red River by Marcy R. Rendon. Um, I just read this last year. This is the first in a, as of right now, three book series, a mystery series um, about a uh, young woman, Cash Black Bear, who is native. It's set in the 70s. Um, and she's just kind of, she's a young adult. She ha was raised in foster care, which is unfortunately was very common among the native populations. Um, but there is a, there was a police officer who kind of took her under his wing and she's trying to make the most of her life. She also, man, I can't believe this woman's still alive because she drinks and smokes like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> but is, she's a really kind of a character you can really get behind and root for. So uh, Marcy um, R. Rendon, I have this up here, make sure I had it right. She is a member of the White Earth Band of the Minnesota Chippewa. So she, um, geographically very close to Louise Erdrich. Um, as far as I understand, there are still more books coming. The third book, which is Sinister Graves, I, I, I keep saying it's going to be my next ebook to read. And I just, it, it, I'll get to it by the end of the year. <laughs> um, she, um, Marcia Rundin also does have a story in this collection. So if you want to see if you like her writing, there you go. <laughs> this will help you. Um, I really enjoy it. It's not it, it's definitely, if you're looking for something that's not super, um, it's more accessible because it is a mystery. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a mystery novel. It's, it's a genre. And if that's a genre that works for you, that might be a good entry point. And then oh, this next book, this is one that, that I had never heard of. And then I've done it for three different book clubs. And this is Two Old Women by Velma Wallace. This is a very, very short book. Um, Velma Wallace is an ath, ath I, I'm sorry if I slaughtered this, ath, Athabascan, which is actually Native Alaskan. And this is her um, retelling of an Athabascan tale about two old women who um, 
their 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 tribe their group has um hit some really hard times it's a hunter-gatherer tribe nomadic and as you if you know anything about alaska you know winter is hard there um and the tribe is very worried that they're not going to have resources for the entire tribe so basically they make the decision that these these women are not contributing to the tribe and need to be left behind and it's kind of like but left behind means basically left behind to die because it's in the winter um and these two old women are like yeah no uh-uh and so they 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 are refused to fall to this fate and they make a go of it i have as i said i had never heard of this book and then i have since done it in three different book clubs and the third book club i did it in was my library book club and fortunately i have my own copy of it but um when the library chooses books, they're really careful to choose books that have lots of copies in the library system, so there's no problem getting the book. Well, when they put this book on the list, there wasn't a problem, but when we came to it, they all the copies were checked out and reserved, and it was very difficult for people to get a copy from the library. Again, fortunately, I had my own copy. And the reason was so many book clubs were doing it. <laughs> So uh, this is, and it's a very short, easy read, very thought provoking. It's um, delightful in its own way, but it's also kind of like, hmm, hmm, how am I, what do I think of this? Highly recommend this one. And this is one that flies under the radar, unless apparently you're in a book club. This next one, um, you will be seeing some more in coming months in the video that will come out next week that I will explain. But that is The Seed Keeper by Diane Wilson. Um, I first read this last year uh, for a book Cougars read along. And um, this is about a native woman who, she um, she's a widow. Her, her husband, she marries a non-native man and she's a widow. She has a farm to take care of. There's issues about agriculture. So there's the native issues and then issues about agriculture in it um, and about the native culture and kind of what's happened to it. Um, I really, really enjoyed this book. I will be reading this in December for two reasons, um, which I will talk about next month. You can probably figure it out if you know what's going on in booktube. But um, I forgot to check this before I started to see what Diane Wilson's um, Diane Wilson's tribal affiliation was. So I'm very sorry about that. Let me look that up. Okay, thank you. I, I looked this up. Um, she is a descendant of the Medua Canton descendant, and she is a member, an enrolled member at the Rosebud Reservation, which is in South Dakota. Um, however, she lives in Minnesota. So highly recommend The Seed Keeper by Diane Wilson, and you'll be hearing more about this from me. The next is I have a book that um, I talked about earlier in this year because I, I read it earlier this year um, and I did really enjoy it. And that is The Lost Journals of Sakahawea by Deborah Magpie Erling. Um, I think it's pretty obvious from the title what this book is about. Um, if you don't know who Sakahawea is or Sacagawea, um, she was a young native woman who was married to a French trapper. The French trapper was hired as an uh, interpreter for the Lewis and Clark um, expedition, the Corps of Discovery, as they went um, to the, the Pacific Ocean. So she she and her, she was pregnant at the time. She had a baby on the trip. Um, she was very young, um, went along with it. Um, her husband was completely and utterly useless. He was just he was. I mean, if you read the journals of Lewis and Clark, even they say he was useless. However, she was quite an asset to um, to Lewis and Clark and their expedition. Expedition, and so there's a lot of mythology about her. Um, and this book really kind of cuts through that because a lot of the mythology about Sakahawea is to make us non-native people feel good, and her life was probably a lot harder than we're willing to recognize. And um, Deborah Magpie Erling really goes into that. Word of warning with this one is it is a hard book to read, both in terms of subject matter, but also Deborah Magpie Erling made the decision not to explain things, native things. So you have to be okay with going in and accepting there's going to be things you don't understand and maybe learning through context, but, but it's not her job to educate you. Does that make sense? It's This is a very native-centered book. Um, really liked it. I am always a little careful to recommend this just because of the difficulty with it. 
And the last book that I have is one of the few five stars that I have given this year. I read this really early on in the year. Um, and this is a short story collection and I don't see this one ever, anywhere. Um, and this is The Beadworkers by Beth Piatote. She's um, a member of the Nez Perce tribe. So the Nez Perce tribe is in like Eastern Oregon and Idaho. She currently lives in the San Francisco Bay area. But this is clearly Portland, Oregon. And um, these books all take, all the stories, this is a short story collection, all the short stories in this book take place in Oregon or at least partly in Oregon. One of them takes place in my hometown. And uh, so that was really interesting. And I really loved this. This is this is like one of my other five-star books this year. It's a very personal five-star because while I read a lot of indigenous literature, I very rarely read anything about uh, the native culture in the Pacific Northwest because a lot of it was obliterated. Um, or at least, you know, a, a, you know, at least wiped over. Um, let me talk about the stories and then I'll go a little bit more into this. These stories are just beautiful. They talk about friendship, family, love, the native experience. I don't understand why I haven't seen this book everywhere. I don't. The final story in here, story, I'm going to put air quotes about that, is actually a play. And um, it is Antigone, which is a native retelling of Antigone, which I actually, I need to reread that because I actually just saw the play of Antigone last Friday, <laughs> the high school put it on. But yeah, so she experiments with different uh, styles of writing in here. This book needs so much more attention. So if you can find, it's, it's a hard book to find because it's small print. Um, Counterpoint is the publisher, um, but it's out there. You can probably order it. Um, you might not find it in a bookstore. I did find this in my bookstore, but then again, I live in Oregon, so. <laughs> It makes sense. It was there. Um, but I think that if you're not in Oregon or maybe Washington, you're not going to find this in a bookstore, but you, you can order it. So uh, let me, I'm going to talk a little bit about the native culture in my area and then talk about a resource. So I do think it's really important to know whose land you're on. And um, so I grew up I, I am, I grew up in Oregon, but I did not grow up here where I live in Oregon. I grew up in Salem, Oregon, which has its own tie because um, we all know about the residential schools. The second oldest residential school and one of only two still in existence is in Salem, Oregon. It's Shamawa Indian School. Now, the goal of that school is no longer assimilation. It is much more about preserving native culture, which is good, but there are still a lot of problems with that school for various, mostly financial and mostly it's not a priority to govern it, government agencies sort of thing. Um, so I'm not saying it's a utopia by any stretch of the imagination, but it is still there. Um, so I, I always kind of knew that. Um, and they do talk a little about Shamawa in here. Um, but where I live now, I have actually found out a little bit of the native history here. So the tribe that was here was, it's, it's a tribe that's had, we're not really sure how it was pronounced. Um, it's current, it's written frequently as at Pilati. Um, and I'll see that in a little bit. Um, there was some, um, like trappers had recorded there being a Thwa sound in it. Um, it became Tualatin to the European settlers who came in. I live in the Tualatin Valley. The Tualatin River is about an eighth of a mile that way. So, um, so the Atfalati, I'm gonna say that just because that's the easiest way for me to say it, and I'm sorry, I know it's not a correct pronunciation, was one of, I think, five different tribes that formed the Kalapuya Nation. So, um, and I, I kind of say that because this changes. Um, unfortunately, the Atfalati and some of the other tribes did not do well when um, the the European, we're talking trappers at this point, came to the area because of disease. They were not a bellicose nation. There was not armed conflict between the two, um, but there were disease issues and a lot of the population died due to disease. The last known um, member of that tribe or last person who identified as part of that tribe uh, died in the first half of the 20th century at the Yakima Reservation in Washington. So the tribe is not, it doesn't really exist anymore. And a lot of the other Kalapuya tribes don't. Um, now, when they come to emancipation, there was all this issue. The remain, what was remained 
what remains of those tribes kind of came together as the Kalapuya tribe. So now that's recognized as a bigger tribe in our area. Um, and that is now part of the uh, Confederation of Grand Ronde, which is um, one of the bigger uh, organizations of tri of different uh, tribal communities. There's a town of Grand Ronde. It's kind of between the, the valley and the coast. So there's a casino there, we know. Um, but they, they, have, they include a number of tribes. The Kalapuya is one of them. So now I want to talk about a resource. Um, I will say that this resource is great if you are in the Americas, um, Australia, or New Zealand. The rest of the world it's spotty as of now it may improve and this is called native lands um and this is an app where you can go in and it shows you know where you are and whose land you're on what their language is you can also put in different locations to see what's going on there and i made a little video of it i first time i tried a voiceover i'm going to insert it here hopefully it works we'll see you never know okay let's see if it works Okay, here's the app. This is what it looks like when you open it. That blue dot there is where I am, and we're zooming in on it. And you can see that the nearest tribe to where I am is the At, it says here At Flati, but that's not how it's pronounced. Um, and all the tribes are, are color coded, so you can see the difference in them. And we're zooming back out of them. And here I'm gonna put in my father's zip code so we can see what it looks like in a different part of the country. So he's in Arizona, and he's right on between two different territories. One's the Hohokam, and one's the Paskayaki. But you can see where he is, and there I accidentally moved the pin. Sorry about that. Okay, now I'm going to try a zip code of someplace I used to live. That is coming up here. It would be pretty clear where I'm going. Uh, yeah, that's Massachusetts. I lived in Boston, so the tribe there was the Massachusetts and the Pawtucket tribe. Now there's other things you can do here. One thing is you can um, see the languages, the native languages of the area. So um, the native language of that area was Massachusetts. Not surprising because it's Massachusetts. Um, and we're going to go back just a second here. Yep. Now we're going back to where I am. So here are the two different languages are the uh, Chinookwala and the Kalapuya. And then another feature you can do here is look up to see the treaty um, that that led to, you know, their land being taken away, basically. Um, so you can go in and see which treaty that was. And then if you wanted to go read it, you could go ahead and do that. Okay, so that was Native Lands. That's one I just keep on my phone and I'll talk, you know, bring it out with the kids. And we'll say whose land are we on and um, we can just look it up and see. I have an iPhone. I am not sure if that there's a, this works on Android. I should have said that earlier. So it, it does work on iPhone. It is a completely free app. Um, highly recommend it and get through the, st the store. Um, so yeah, so these are some native, uh, um, native literature recommendations that I have that I haven't seen other places this month, but there are a lot out there. Listen to recommendations that other people have. Um, I did a video earlier this month. I'll, t I'll link it down below of what I'm planning to read this month, um, which is not included in this other than finishing Never Whistle at Night. Um, so there's some more books there. Um, but I really do uh, recommend that you at least pick something up. Um, it's such a rich collection of cultures and there's so much to learn from them and they deserve our respect so i would and if you're if you're not in the united states um you know canada has the same thing it all through all through the americas the indigenous cultures are all through the americas and there are indigenous cultures all over the world um and i think it's time that we recognize them so anyway thank you very much um i am going to cut this off here uh, let me know if you are reading something that I have not mentioned here, or you have a recommendation. I love recommendations and, uh, subscribe, like join my discord information down below. I'll talk to you later. Bye.